Assalamu alaikum everyone. Um, I'm Farah Sayyid and I, on behalf of the organizers, I want to warmly welcome you to the second Pathways to Development Conference. Uh, the conference theme this year is Inequality and Social Justice in Growing Recognition of the Inequal Distribution of Growth and Progress Across Populations and Geographies. Um, and the urgency of this discussion has never been clearer than in the times we are in now. <clears throat> to start off the conference, I'd like to invite Mr. Shahid Hussain, uh, Rector Lums. Um, as the Rector of LAMS, Chairman of Businessmen Hospital Trust and the Shahid Hussain Foundation, and Member Board of Governors National Management Foundation, Mr. Hussain remains committed to improving the state of health, education, and employment in the country. Mr. Shahid Hussain. Bismillahir Rahman Rahim. On behalf of uh, Lahore University of Management Sciences, Mushtaq Ahmed Gurmani School of Social Sciences and Humanities, and Chaudhry Nazir Muhammad School of Economics, it is my pleasure to welcome you all to the conference, Pathways to Development. With an impressive list of speakers and scholars, this three-day event promises to be very engaging and, of course, thought-provoking. While you are on campus, I would uh, encourage you to ask around or meet other people and learn more about the five schools of the university. Each one of the schools has its own strengths. And the biggest strength on uh, campus and in the, on this university we find is the interdisciplinarity and the work that is happening across the schools. Such conferences are uh, a way of reaching out so this is inward flow of uh, scholars coming on campus or speaking from distance is important not only for our own faculty, but also our students and our effort to, to, to introduce ourselves to the international community. This summer 2024 promises another exciting event which is the IEEE International Conference, which will be held here at LAMS. It is a sign of our maturing faculty and the excellent work that they are doing. I would like to acknowledge and thank all of our partners who have come together to hold this, this event. Thank you very much, and I hope all of you have a good stay here. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hussain. Um, so this conference is a collaborative effort um, by social science research centers and institutions supporting cutting edge research in Pakistan. Uh, the consortium consists of the, the Department of Economics and MHRC at LAMS, IDEAS, CDPR, IDS Sussex, SERP, and the IGC. Um, I'd like to now invite doc Dr. Chima, who has the distinction, um, and I'm sure sometimes the burden, of being the only individual who all seven consortium partners claim as their own. Um, thank you, Farah. Um, this is uh, indeed, as Shahid Saab has said, extremely exciting. I, I just want to say a few words about the ecosystem that is there now in Lahore. Um, so we have, you know, these uh, partner institutions, the Institute of Development and Economic Alternatives, uh, LAMS, um, uh, the MHRC and Economics Department, the uh, Institute of Development Studies at Sussex, CDPR, IGC, um, and SERP. Um, and I think Lahore at this point is very vibrant, but each of these centers are engaging um, a, a, with uh, closely on questions of policy, as Shahid Saab has said, are the schools uh, at LAMS. Um, and this, we felt two years ago, that this creates a foundation where we should start having um, academic conferences um, in Pakistan, because I, I think there's a bit of a disconnect, and the disconnect is there is uh, a lot of work now happening in Pakistan, on Pakistan, 
but a lot of the work that happens on Pakistan doesn't get presented in Pakistan. Um, and I think you know a lot of people do the work here, but they go to the global north to make the presentations. And I think the benefits, the spillover benefits that can come about uh, within the country get muted. Um, so last year, we decided to have a conference which was an invited conference largely. Uh, we also have a very egalitarian um, committee, which is constitute conference committee that constitutes members of uh, each of these institutions, along with uh, academics who are abroad. And the consensus was we should move towards an open call. Um, and I was one of the people who was a bit skeptical about that, but I was completely proven wrong. Uh, because we got a huge number of submissions. We got close to about 200 submissions of papers. Um, and I'd say you know, about 100 of them were really high quality, included from people over here. So initially, the plan was to do a two-day conference. But in the end, we had to actually add a day. Um, it had become so difficult. The conference was also peer-reviewed. Um, so there was a kind of rigorous uh, peer review process. Um, and on the conference program, you'll see members of the core conference committee and then the generous contribution of our academic collaborators all over the world who, who uh, diligently uh, did peer review um, you know, as a ma ma matter of professional service. Um, so I don't want to kind of dwell uh, more on this, but Shahid Saab has already said we have quite an impressive program. I, I do want to say one thing and highlight one thing, that there is now uh, a, a whole number. I mean, I haven't seen so many Pakistanis going into academics and doing such exciting scholarship. Uh, they're based in different parts of the world. Um, so it is, uh, you know, a moment uh, for Pakistan. When I was a PhD student, the depth of research on Pakistan by Pakistanis was not as deep uh, as it is today. So it is extremely important, not only this conference, that we continue to come together, but I think also that we take the findings that we are sharing in uh, academic conferences towards policymakers and to try and have an impact on uh, practice and policy in society. Um, and you know, I think that's a nice segue uh, into uh, our first keynote speaker. Uh, although we're supposed to start at 9.30, but perhaps we can start a bit early. Is that OK? OK. Um, so you know, we, we have four keynote speakers. Each of them are talking about um, things which are really important uh, in the world today. Uh, today, we have with us Stefan de Con, who is a professor of economic policy at Blavatnik School of Government um, and the economics department at Oxford. He is also the director of the Center for the Study of African Economics, which is a very kind of prominent center at Oxford. Um, the thing about Stefan is that you know one grew up reading Stefan's stuff. <laughs> um, I was a PhD student in Cambridge when it started to come up, which is kind of looking at um, micro development. Um, and particularly in the UK, uh, his work was having a huge impact. Uh, but then he transitioned from there to also uh, take up policy roles. So he became, um, between 2011 and 2017, he was the chief economist of the De uh, Department of International Development uh, at the UK. And between 20 and 22, he was the development policy advisor to successive foreign secretaries at the UK's Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. So he combines very kind of rich uh, academic experience with high level policy experience. And he's here today to, I guess his talk will be based on his recent book um, called Gambling on Development, Why Some Countries Win and Others Lose, which was published in May 2022. It's kind of provocative in ideas, uh, makes us think. Um, and the book sort of draws on his academic work, but also his very deep policy engagement across countries. Um, I don't want to kind of give spoilers about the talk or the book, 
Uh, but the big thing that I think he's pushing us to think is that for a very long time, uh, we've thought about you know, what are the right set of policies um, that countries can get right. So that's where the emphasis has been. And the book sort of takes a step back. And it's to really talking about what's the kind of elite bargain that can happen or that is required in the first place to even start to get the policies right. Um, so it's kind of opening a door into the political economy of the question of what are the different paths countries end up taking. Um, and I think he's going to draw on the book to talk about Pakistan, which he's calling a hard country. Um, you know, it's more like no country for old men. But, um, but the important thing is that there is a whole slew of work now in the area of political economy, which is really uh, talking about how countries sort of walk on different paths. Um, and it'll be interesting to situate this conversation with Stefan um, in the context of that work. Um, so Stefan is going to give us a lecture for about 40 minutes, and then there'll be a moderated discussion for about 20. So Stefan, it's over to you. Right. See whether we get some slides up. So um, I don't think he's given away everything, and that's helpful. <laughs> what I want to do is, is indeed talk a little bit and indeed dwelling a bit on, 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 on some of the insights I learned from, uh, from, from working on my book, which, by the way, didn't have a Pakistan chapter. But then I know just quite a lot of people recognize Pakistan in some of the analysis. So I've dug a bit deeper ever since beginning to write. But I wanted to put us in this position that many of us find ourselves in, as academics keen to well, be a little bit useful, you know, hopefully having a little bit of impact, finding a way of advising policymakers, finding a way of actually, you know, somehow getting some of the things we learn and do, having some influence or impact on what's going on in the country. Okay, and so, so while I will indeed talk a little bit about some of the themes of the book, I will put it back into that context. Okay, and so, um, you know, we are academics here, so you give your conclusions first, um, making sure there is there's no who done it here, there's no mystery story here that I'm going to tell you, but the key thing is is probably three points that I want to get get across to you is that. You know, if we want to give advice, we better understand the context we're giving advice in. It may seem self-evident, but it is actually something that we tend to forget. We, we love to supply stuff. And then we don't really think, you know, well, how, how does this fit? How will that work through a system? And so basically, the key thing I want to emphasize here, and there's many more things that you should think about, is do we have a good sense of the objective function of those who are we trying to advise and influence? What, are they, what do they want? And it's a very strange thing that as economists who teach our first year st uh, students the theory of the second best, once it comes to our own actions in policy advice, we don't really care about these constraints, or we just push our advice. And then think, that's the best we can do. Now, the theory of the second best tells us that if there are certain constraints, trying to implement the second best uh, as if there are no constraints doesn't really get us the best solution. It's a third best, and second best is something that takes it into account. So it's a very simple idea, but we don't really do when we are trying to uh, be relevant. Now, I'll talk quite a bit about Pakistan, and indeed I will talk what I think I worry about what the objective function is here. And therefore, why it is a hard country to advise, because the objective function is not the one we tend to assume in our, in our theories, in our models, as the objective function of a country. And that's what I want to talk about. So I, I borrowed the word a hard country from Anthony Levin. You know, there's other books to doing it, but you know, you get it. 
There's a paper that I've been trying to, it's a very simple paper at the moment, it's a working paper on the political economy of advice that I, in a sense, draw upon for at least that part of the advice. So let's briefly get this. You know, as economists, we are very much like, definitely coming out of a US tradition, a bit like Lucas would sum it up. You know, we're going to give advice, and this is Robert Lucas saying, you know, we're going to be very clear what do we have evidence on? And we will advise you on this, and we will tell you the best evidence on, on a particular problem. Okay? And so that's what we do. So it's an interesting thing is that we offer you advice based on all the things we know. You know, we're not asking you necessarily what do you know, but actually we, we will give that advice. And in the practice in development, and you know, I'm as as uh, Alishima correctly said, you know, I do micro work. I do my RCTs, I do my other types of work. You know, it's very exciting to, to do some of these things. And then we're getting a lot more attention these days in people saying, look, we should offer this evidence. You know, let's offer this evidence. And it's all about presentation. It's all about how you actually approach them and so on and so on and so on. It's fine. But it's always supply. We supply. And uh, it's a very strange, strange thing because some, sometimes, and this is done a paper a lot of people quote these days, American Economic Review, Jordan, and others, um, you know, there may be, they have a case, at least in Brazil, that if they supply some advice on evidence, on something to do, usually most of these studies are all about tax collection, they say, look, we can actually break through when we give advice because the policymakers are quite happy to, to, uh, to accept it. Now, OK, let me have a little cynic in me. If we're going to do research and all the examples on, on evidence is all about how I give you more money, how do I get you as a government official more money? As that the basis is of the best way we be thinking about evidence, you know, getting a government department to have more money is probably a slightly easier problem than trying them to make something sensible and do some reforms in their own organizations. Okay? So we have to be a bit careful in what, what we do, but it's always about the supply. Actually, the worst offenders, just looking around whether anyone is here from the World Bank or from the IMF, but the worst offenders are typically the international organizations. Okay, and, and you know, and arguably, you know, I used to work for different, probably we as well. You know, we love supplying, supplying, supplying. And so you go World Bank missions, best practice is this. Oh, yes, we have some World Bankers here. <laughs> Sorry, I see. Uh, <laughs> um, and, and, you know, you present international best practice. Now, again, there's nothing wrong per se, but if you want to have impact, don't just keep on supplying. You know, just international best practice is, you know, there may be, you know, maybe in Sweden something worked, you know, but. This is not Sweden, okay? Um, the IMF probably more precisely, almost linked to its charter, the way the board works goes very far, far in it. They tend to want to give first best advice. You know, if you look at the kind of things they always recommend, you know, and there's no country in the world which will not say, and, and as a final line, and you should just open up your capital account, you know, the kind of a first best an economist dreamland of basically, you know, if we get everything, the markets to work perfectly, we will do that. You give this first best advice. Now, the IMF is an interesting case, you know, because then we say, oh, well, put it in the conditions. Ten conditions, say. You know, if you look sometimes at this list and then see what we mean by completion of a program, Actually, it's something Pakistan doesn't know much about since it never completes. But, um, but, but countries do complete IMF programs, you may be surprised to hear. Um, but it's often on the basis of 8 out of 10 of the things they did, or 7 out of 10. Now, 7 out of 10 is not second best, necessarily. Okay, So it is still, you know, the low-hanging fruit, well, there's probably a reason why politically they're low-hanging, because nobody cares. Uh, and then you have a few other things that you may well be doing. So in a sense, you, you just want to be, be, be careful to simply saying, oh, imperfectly implemented first best is better than, no, that's not second best. That's not second best. That's not the, the best one to do, given the constraints. So the problem is that we assume, typically in our work, and that's, I think, the core of the work, say, of the IMF, that you want macroeconomic stability, that, that's actually what you committed to, and this is the list you, we think you should be doing for that, or you assume you're dealing with a government that wants development, that actually says, that's my primary objective. And so a lot of our work, you know, those of us who've still done basic normative welfare economics, 
Well, we always kept on saying, ooh, how shall we write the, so the, the objective function, social welfare function, some form of weighted average maybe between equity and efficiency or, or something like that, you know, some poverty indicator in it or whatever. We assume that surely that's what the policymaker wants. Now, advice that we give based off the wrong objective function, you have to ask yourself, well, what does that mean? And so basically, we supplying advice too much with, without explicit consideration of these objectives. And so, and it's not necessarily then the best possible advice we can give if we do it based on the wrong objective function, if that's not the one that the policymaker will have. And what am I thinking about? I'm not thinking only about conspiracy stuff. You know, it could be about, you know, bureaucratically, there's just no way the institution will ever want to implement this. And they will do all they can not to do it because it fundamentally goes again, you know, the, the equivalent of, uh, you know, as they say in England, Turkey's one vote for Christmas. You know, you, you will not do it. You will find a way of doing it. Now, if you don't take into account how difficult something will be to implement, so why do you propose it to start with? You know, you, how, how you think about it. There could be legal constraints. It may actually require all kinds of things that need to be changed that is impossible. And then, of course, we get into, you know, industrialists in Parliament will not vote for an energy uh, price cut. Agricultural um, uh, landlords will not vote in Parliament for a fertilizer price uh, a subsidy removal. And then you say, well, what am I saying? I can keep on having that list. And fuel reform is actually one of the typical ones. Yeah, sure, it makes sense not to have fuel subsidies. Why is it that so many countries can't get rid of them? And is that then the best thing is then keep on repeating, remove your fuel subsidies, knowing full well that it oft often doesn't work. Anyway, and this is a bit like the overall objectives of the, of the state. So my argument is, is that, well, if you want to have development in a country, well, you only achieve it if, broadly speaking, those who have power and influence in a country want development as well. You know, that's a simple thing, but it's a necessary condition. You know, getting development and growth in an economy where fundamentally the incentives of those who control all policy making is not about growth and development, well, you're not going to get it. And in fact, this is a bit the theme in my book, and based in case studies, that if we start looking at all these different countries that made progress, you somehow or another got enough attention to growth and development. Never in a perfection, but there was enough there. And let me say a bit more about it in a moment. And basically, my argument is, if you don't want to be useful as researchers, and by the way, I don't want necessarily researchers all to be useful. We should be able to do research and thinking through problems and articulate problems. It's not all about policy. But if we think we want to influence, then we'll better start thinking about these things as well. So, let me now build up, and this is a bit built on, on, on my books, a bit like, like the, the, the core argument that I have. How do I, want, how do I suggest, maybe, we can think about the objective function, okay? There's a big empirical question, and I can come back to that, but we can start thinking about what the objective function of, of, of states is. And if we then start looking, well, you know, it's probably not bad looking back to think, you know, what do we think was probably the objective function of states over time? And, and one of the remarkable things of the last three, three decades is that um, it was an amazing time for countries that wanted to progress. It was an amazing time. You know, it's amazingly, you know, the per capita growth rate of lower middle income countries since 1990 was in per capita terms 3.9%. So that means every 20 years uh, they would have doubled um, um, well, it's about every 18 years, 17 years, they would have doubled GDP per capita, okay? So that means, on average, lower middle income countries are now four times as rich in per capita income terms than they were in 1990. That's the average. And you say, okay, that's a kind of nice benchmark, and you have a list here, the figures you, uh, you can see on the right-hand side. Yeah, of course, there's a, there's a big part is China, but it's also India, belatedly, there's Bangladesh, there is Sri Lanka before its crisis. There's Indonesia, and actually there's even African examples. There's Ghana, there's Ethiopia that did this. I call this in my book the winners of this thing. You know, there was an amazing opportunity, clearly, and certain countries managed to pull it off. The losers in this game, well, you know, some of terrible ones, like in Africa you have Madagascar or Democratic Republic of Congo. They have succeeded now, both of these countries, 
are now only at a GDP per capita about half or even lower than they had in 1960. Okay, so that's quite an achievement to, in such a period, keep on going downhill. Now, Pakistan is well below the mean. It's a 2% per year per capita growth rate. It's actually in one of these places, well, you know, it didn't quite manage to take, um, take these advantages. And if you look closer at Pakistan, well, you know, unfortunately, you know these things. Uh, I don't have to dwell too much about it. If you think of human development indicators, it's not just about growth. You know, these days, you know, your, your rate of progress of Pakistan is well, is much lower than Ghana has achieved, that India, Bangladesh, Nepal have achieved. You know, this is, you know, there's something gone not quite right. Now, how do we understand these differences? And I'll come into the case of, of Pakistan a bit, and I'll be blunt, and forgive me, I'll be blunt as kind of trying to get at it and maybe not nuanced enough. The main thing actually to understand is that if you look at those successful places, they're quite diverse places, you know? There's not that obviously in common between Ghana, Ethiopia, Bangladesh, China, Indonesia, India. There's not that much in common, simply speaking, you know? There's, this is not somehow, oh, it's obvious. This is not like the East Asian miracle where we had something like this. Is, this gets a much more diverse bunch of countries. In the book, and in general, I think many people hopefully would agree with me, is that if you look at it, this is not a simple why nations fail story, not Ashimogli Robinson. Because there you say, if you look like Britain or any of its offshoots like America, then you'll be successful. And if not, yeah, you won't. I, I think that's unfortunately in the way if you read the book very carefully, there's a particular set, a particular recipe, what perfection looks like and you have that, then you'll be successful, and otherwise, yeah, and of course, many of the not so successful places don't have this, but the interesting thing about this recent period is that, yes, this is not about GDP per capita of Singapore levels, but this is about beginning of takeoff. These countries did it with a lot of imperfection, you know? None of these places had institutions that you would put in the category of perfect inclusive institutions, whether it's about rule of law, about property rights, about democracy, whatever. No, in fact, they're quite ugly in many ways. They're quite messy. They're quite hard in many ways. There's a lot of corruption, very poor governance uh, issues there. It's definitely there. This is not as if they look like Sweden, therefore they've been successful. No, they don't look like Sweden in these places, the successful ones. So that's not what they have in common. In fact, political systems, I was just a week in China and reminded uh, that, um, yeah, you have to be careful once in a while. Um, you know, very different political places. You know, it's not simply like in why nations fail. Yeah, it's democracy that will win. Maybe it will, you know, as a kind of a big prediction. And maybe you need this once you want to get the wealth of or the GDP per capita of European countries. But for takeoff, clearly, again, you have diverse places. Bangladesh had its most successful place, period, actually during democracy. Uh, the, you had India still functioning as a democracy, definitely in that period, uh, very well. But you had autocracies, or whatever you would call them, centrally controlled, uh, very controlled states like China. You had military places, military regimes. You had all kinds of things. So it's, again, not that's what they have in common. Okay, it's not simply the political system. And then, actually, the most interesting thing is that Ali Shima already was alluding to, it's not simply a, recipe, a policy recipe. You know, there was a time that people said, there is that simple policy recipe. If you start looking more carefully about it, it's not quite so clear. And in fact, already by Michael Spence, Nobel Prize winner Michael Spence, was leading in the Growth Commission, summarizing the growth experience of about 30 countries in the world that had managed to get at least 7% of growth for 30 years. Well, you know, if you read that document, it's actually quite amusing because there's lots of people trying to find a recipe in it, but Bob Solo properly told at one of their meetings, Robert Solo, he said, you know, well, you know, look, if you are, they asked him, so how do you explain Bangladesh? He said, look, I don't know, you know, in terms of growth, I may be, and we know him as the, probably one of the greatest thinkers around growth. Um, he said, you know, we know the ingredients. 
but don't ask me for a recipe, I have no idea, okay? And, and if you then look at the details of it, you know, it comes down to, yeah, once there's macroeconomic pressures, they manage to correct, they don't have all time stability, but they're pretty good at keeping it going, the macro stability, they're pretty good at correcting errors in economic policy, they, um, they typically trust somehow global prices or export orientation or, or working around that. They don't have one exchange rate regime. Some have undervalued, some have um, market exchange rates. They don't do exactly that, but somehow or another, it's probably almost as broad the three things that I have there on the slide that they maybe did. Now, that's still a broad family, okay? That's a broad family of things. That's not about infrastructure-led first or, or health and education, human capital-led. No, they find somehow or another some way of doing it. The question that becomes then interesting, if the recipe, there's no single recipe, and there's actually quite a lot of recipes that you cannot do in your places, means you have choice. In fact, Donald Kabaruka, who is a former finance minister of Rwanda, but he is a big champion in Africa of telling governments as they, sh as, they should, as they should hear it about economic matters. And he keeps on berating them and said, do you know that growth is a choice? It's not something that comes from outside. It's a choice. And he means if you do some reasonable things, you can actually get that. Not Singapore growth or China growth, but you can get better than Malawi of like 1% per capita per year. You can do better. The question actually you have to ask is, why do so many countries still do unreasonable economic policies? So why don't they actually manage to get a reasonable set of economic policies together? And actually, there's a more interesting question, or put it differently, <clears throat> why is it in their actions and behavior they seem to be pursuing another objective function than the one we typically assume in our work of growth and development. So why do they do it? And we need to then think carefully about it. So <clears throat> I'm pretty sure it's not because they're stupid or that they are uh, ignorant. It's not about, oh, as long as we keep on telling them, getting the message. You know well enough, you talk to people here, I talk to people here, it's not certain things are not defended because they really believe that's the best thing for growth and development. That's not, they may have arguments and they may write newspaper articles in that language, but you know full well that they know that it's not true. We know, may not know exactly the end of the recipe, but we know that there are unreasonable policies and there are reasonable ones. We know more or less somehow, not exactly, but we, we, we do it. So why do they, when we then come and don't give, uh, give, try to give sensible advice, why don't they follow it? And so for me, this basically, well, we have to be willing to ask the question, you know, what does controlling the state look like? What does it look like? What is the underlying deal that sets the objective function of a country at a particular moment in time? Now we come back a little bit, back to basic institutional economics, where it's, you know, Douglas North, his last book before I passed away, Violence and Social Orders, it's probably the most interesting book, I think, of the many that he wrote. Definitely in the beginning, you get the essence already there. You know, the first paragraph is basically say, think of a state in the old Max Weber tradition as a solution to the problem of violence, and think of it somehow as a coalition, a dominant coalition, get your game theory out, you know, the idea of a dominant coalition in a game with lots of players, and how is that somehow that equilibrium set up, is essentially elite groups, people with power and influence, they somehow make an agreement of how they will control the state, its resources, its capital, and how they will control who has access to the state and to the resources of the country, who can do what in a country. So think of it somehow as every state, as if you want to understand what's going on, as essentially this kind of deal between groups with power and influence. And this is the framework I want to use in the book, borrowing it heavily from lots of other people. Think of a state as an elite bargain, and don't reduce economic policy to the minister of finance or the governor of the central bank, but just understand properly who are all these people that shape somehow what is possible, what is not possible? What are we pursuing, what are we not pursuing? 
And that actually includes you know, the politicians, the business, the civil servants, the military. It will include uh, intellectuals, journalists, the storytellers. You know, all of them will be their part of it. And it's all about understanding that coalition of power that, that exists. And at the minimum, in the old Max Weber sense, a state is only really a state if it can somehow control violence so that it does to doesn't totally fragment. It's often to do at minimum, it's a coalition for, for, for stability. And it always will involve some political deal, but also an economic deal. And these things will be very close together. Okay, basic political economy, political economics that you could think about. So, and then it becomes, spooky. Okay, let me say that I had real fun also trying to work with that writing a book, comparative development about, about 30 different countries that through the luck that I had that I could have spent time uh, some more in some, more in some places than in others to actually start looking. And you, know, you do meet the extreme form of an elite bargain like in uh, Democratic Republic of Congo where basically you know, that is a kleptocracy. You know, I will still call it, it's elections at the moment. No, this is still a kleptocracy. If you, can, if you have access to the state, it's a license to steal. It's quite, quite striking, and you know, it's very hard to call it differently. It definitely was the case under Mobutu, under the two Kabilas, uh, father, son. It's basically, if you control the state, then you have a license to steal. There's endless stories you could tell about what it is like to be a business in that country, but it is the stories are mind-boggling. You know, you think this is a hard place, just try to do business in the DRC. Um, you could then have a much more common form where it's all an elite bargain that's based on patronage. You know, say a Middle Eastern country, it's very strongly patronage-based elite bargain. And then, of course, you get variations of it where patronage is the essence of the game, but actually it is fundamentally also clientelist. You know, you, who is in charge, the patron, can change quite a lot unless you keep on rewarding those people that put you in power, like clientelism, you reward with contracts, with jobs, with benefits, with whatever it is, those people who bring you in power and then keep you in power. So there's this uh, kind of deal that's going on. And by the way, democracies almost by design tend to have a very clientelist aspect. You know, you need to reward your constituents for voting for you. So, so this is not about saying, oh, this only applies to these places called developing countries and not the 34 OECD who have sorted their inclusive institutions, if you take Asimogli Robinson too seriously. Uh, it's not like that. You know, we know as well, I used to work essentially in the top office of a foreign secretary of a G7 country. Hmm, interesting, okay. Certain things I can't quite tell you, but you will, some of you who've worked in advising ministers in other places, will recognize, you know, it is not simply that in a democracy suddenly none of these things will happen. And, you know, and it's not about corruption, by the way, it's about legal forms of it. Who has access, who cannot do it, how you set the rules, how you do the, the, the things and so on. So, you know, you could have clientelist democracies. You could also have democracies or autocracies where actually the bureaucracy is fundamentally quite meritocratic. I will say that that was the joy for me as a foreigner as a Belgian working in the British Civil Service, it's pretty meritocratic and that actually helps you, even if the objective function is a bit murky at times, but at least the system doesn't get compromised too much in that whole thing. I was in China now, that's of course part of its success that actually the civil service is actually still largely meritocratic, even within a system with a very particular political control of an objective function, it helps you with delivery, clearly. Anyway, but you could similarly have autocratic state with clientelist uh, systems. All these things are possible. And I just want to emphasize, lots of things are possible. Okay, and that's, that's helpful. So where, how do you then get growth and development? So where is it at some places? So it's not simply by the system, by the underlying thing, you know. Bangladesh and Indonesia are pretty clientelist in the way they operate. It's actually... When you want growth and development, the key part of it, well, is somehow or another, and the somehow or another I'll define in a moment, but somehow or another, growth and development is strong enough part of that objective function that underlines the elite deal of control and power in a country. Somehow or another, it's strong enough, okay? 
And, and without that, if the objective function is not growth and development, it's just going to be very hard to actually do any serious change on these matters. But if it is, it's a great opportunity because then actually you can have some of that progress. Now the question is, so why would an elite actually be interested in these objectives? So why would they? Well, that's an interesting question when you look around. It's that, you know, maybe occasionally they may have conviction. I think it's quite rare, but it's not the first thing. It may be seen as an instrument of keeping power. Actually, it is a strong driver in, say, European countries to stay in power within the system you operate is to actually you better deliver on these things. I will also say in a moment, it was a very strong and important part of the Communist Party of China in 78, 79 to do its reforms because they desperately needed to stay in power. It can be a source of legitimacy. It definitely is in, say, countries like Ethiopia, Rwanda, where an ethnic minority is in charge. It has no legitimacy through the political process. It was looking for legitimacy through growth and development process. In Ethiopia, I would argue, unfortunately, it failed as well. But you get these kind of pressures. It can be part of maximizing rents and saying, you know, why don't we grow the economy? We can all be rich. You know, think of Singapore or Korea. It all worked really well. Now, this is where the interesting thing is. Because things you need to do for growth and development are typically dynamic and longer term, it's quite a gamble for you. And that's what I call this gamble of development. Would you actually be willing to do this? As we see in lots of countries, like Indonesia, President Suharto opened up the economy to Japanese investment in the, 19, uh, in the 1970s. But in the end, this same process of growth and development got an articulate new groups coming emerging. And you could well say he, he basically uh, was kicked out of power because of also the progress the society had made. And so you get basically, it's a gamble. Because actually, growth and development are quite unexpected forces and not easily controllable. In political history in the UK, there is a there is now kind of a view that how did we get democracy? It's not because some elite players, aristocrats, were so enlightened uh, in Magna Carta and beyond. No, no, no. The title of a nice paper is Democracy by Mistake, where P basically, every time you give, you give a bit more access to other groups thinking this is a way to keep control when there's pressures, and at some point, the aristocrats lost out to the, to the commercial people, and then slowly the, the commercials lost uh, power to broader groups and so on. Democracy by mistake is probably the more common way how democracies emerge. So because these gambles, you can't fully control. You know, in Ethiopia, a country that was the fastest growing economy in Africa and one of the fastest in the world in recent, uh, in, in a decade, between 2000, or 15 years between 2005 and 2020, you could argue that somehow or another, the urban youth that suddenly more and more were educated were the ones that actually kicked the particular party out and actually said, look, it's one thing to get some economic legitimacy. If I don't get a big part of the cake, nor if I can get some political say, I'm going to push you out. And indeed, the chaos we have, unfortunately, can be linked to that. So this is what I think has been happening. Very diverse systems. <clears throat> China is interesting. If that you think of, you know, where, how did it really come about, you know? The key thing is here often summed up by Deng Xiaoping saying, it doesn't matter whether the cat is white or black, as long as it catches mice. There's two things that's really interesting. It's dropping of ideology to pursue your goals. But actually, he also redefined the mouse. <laughs> he basically redefined it. We want growth and development because they had noticed after cultural evolution and the stagnation, the tensions even within the party became harder and harder to con contain. And somehow or another, the party was losing legitimacy. This was a quest to keep control of the country. And how will we do it? By legitimacy. And, you know, he had read his, read his Marx. Somehow or another, paradise on earth is quite important for a Marxist. So somehow, better do it in basic 
growth and development. And somehow or another, it's about legitimacy. In that, the repression of Tiananmen Square, you have the readings from the Central Committee that were leaked out that fascinatingly say, you know, no, no, we can't have this disruption because our legitimacy depends on growth and development. And we need to pursue it as the party because the legitimacy of the party is undermined if we open up politically. That's part of how they got where they got to. Bangladesh, fascinating to see. A 1970s after their war of liberation um, and all the political chaos, but also the development chaos in the famine that happened and so on. Somehow the elites that had fought for the independence had no more legitimacy. And people in Bangladesh, it's fascinating. Everybody recognizes something shifted in the elite thinking in the 1980s. Nobody can pin down exactly what it was, but somehow or another, during this period of more intense democracy after, say, 1990, uh, it was very striking that between two parties that, okay, let's put it simply, hated each other, the economic issue was not debated. And there was an implicit understanding that the growth and the, and the inclusion of development, the rise of the NGOs like BRAC and so on, was all acceptable politically. That's an implicit understanding that they have. We can talk more about the other ones. So where does Pakistan fit into it? Well, so you get very far. So you get a political economics of the elite bargain. If you think what probably growth needs is probably fundamentally an outward orientation, actually proper incentives for tradable goods, for markets, for incentives there, well, instead you have a status quo economy, you know, centered around patronage. And then you get this, you know, because in this country it's not what the subsidy is, but who gets it that seems to be most important. It's who gets it, not what it is for, but who gets it. Who gets the tax and who is not taxed. That seems to be important. Of course, the inward, um, inward uh, orientation and so on is all a consequence of that, because it's very hard to run rent-seeking systems when your economy is fundamentally open. It's very hard to run them with a market exchange rate. You may recall that I earlier said successful countries have either an undervalued or a market exchange rate. No country is ever successful with a systematically overvalued exchange rate. But you have to ask, in whose interest is that? And then basically, all these distortions feed all the other part. And by the way, this is not about corruption. Corruption is not the problem in Pakistan. It's legal corruption is the problem. That's what keeps growth down. That's legal. There's nothing about the legally legal distinction that matters here. We focus on the wrong thing often. It's the legal part that matters. And then you get, of course, a whole system. Anyone who knows a bit of uh, economics knows that somehow or another your international budget constraint doesn't work in a system like this. So you have the permanent quest for external finance. Everything is focused on external finance. Everything is around that. So basically, you have an economy that is run like a Middle Eastern rentier economy, but without oil and gas. You can't do that for long. You can do this once in a while, as long as someone bails you out. And, you know, thank you, Russians, to invading Afghanistan. Thank you for 9-11, for the Asin from the economy. If you look at that. But this bailout is not sustainable, this persistent external finance thing. So why does it make the, the reasonable choice? We come back to it. Growth would be a threat to the powers that be. You know, and it basically, it's not the objective. And it's very hard to see from their position. When I talk to politicians that are economic technocrats within political parties, we can see this. It's very hard because all the groups depend on these structures. And it's very hard, you know? It's not an easy thing. By the way, it's not about capability of the civil service. You have extremely capable ones. It's very complicated to run a system to, put, to, to, to actually result to no change. You know, it's very hard to keep on doing that. And it's low, but think of it low implementation. I often think tax over GDP ratios are better understood as a political equilibrium rather than anything to do with tax collection or whatever. It's a pure political equilibrium that they are entrusted to keep on implementing it. And then, as I already included, international players have not helped Pakistan in that sense by bailing you out and there. But we reach a position where it's probably not going to happen again. Okay.
So how do you then do economics and economic advice? Okay, I'm sorry to have depressed you a little bit, but you know, how do you then do this? Okay. Now, this is something, you know, I've been an advisor for very bad ministers in the UK, okay? Very bad ones. Let me name Liz Truss as one of them. Um, you know, imagine advising Liz Truss. Just try to imagine what you know about the UK. Imagine advising Liz Truss. Of course, I did resign at some point. I failed entirely of my categorization. But this was my choice somehow. I can give first best advice, a bit like the international organizations do. But if I give advice, and I've mentioned that already, I give advice for the wrong objective, of course nothing will be implemented. Now, it maybe makes me feel good that I can be the Don Quixote, Don Quixote of, uh, of economic advice and fighting the windmills. And a lot of academics feel already quite happy that a minor newspaper will print their view, and that's fine. But you're not going to change that much. Because somehow or another, you don't have the entry point. Of course, you have other ones, which I unfortunately observe in this country and in my country and all the countries in the world as well, which are fundamentally the mercenaries. By the way, if you work as an economist inside the government system, it's probably the best you can do. You can be the mercenary. It's not a nice thing. That's why I resigned uh, when, when Liz Truss uh, after a few months, because it's, you, know, you can't at some point do it. You have to admit you are a mercenary. It's their objective function you need to serve and you need to do all you can to serve it. That's the civil servant's duty. It's a really hard one. I'm so sympathetic to them. But I want to put to you that there's probably two more forms of advisors that we could have. The minimum amount that I would plead to my fellow economists, including those who work in government, would learn to do better, is to think through what does it mean to be a politically informed advisor, to actually understand what the context you operate in. Okay? Now, you can still, and then think of it, it's a bit like a principal agent problem, where the agent is the government and basically has all the bad objectives of the government. And I'm here as the principal trying to advise. I know there's certain things they can't do. There's certain things they won't do. Can I find within this the best possible things for development or for economic growth? Can I find a way of designing, and I'll give in a moment, if I have a moment still, a few examples from other countries to do this. That's the minimal amount. That's second best. You take the fact that the non-development constraints are there, call it the implementation constraints or the objectives, you take it, you have a decent objective function for growth and development, but take the politics as a constraint properly in your thinking through it. And then when you do this, you realize you may actually advise other things. The one I would love to be and try to be is the subversive advisor. The economist in the room, I would simply say, why don't we make that political constraint endogenous? Why don't we think through things in a way that we take into account the, the, um, the constraint, but begin to think through, look, if I focus on that, actually, I'm probably going to strengthen the right people that actually may well want to do change from within the system. If I support something else, I may actually strengthen the people that even though it may be good in the short run for development, but I may actually strengthen them and as a result be far worse off. Actually, incidentally, um, I see Mowgli and Robinson, and Jim Robinson is a good friend of mine, I know I slag them off, but they have a very nice paper in the Journal of Economic Perspectives that in a way uses that framework in 2003. They don't call it the subversive advisor. You don't get a Nobel Prize by calling yourself subversive. So, um, um, but you can actually think about it. So, and that's, I will then conclude. It's an interesting moment to think like that. Because one of the things we know from a lot of countries that actually went to much more a growth and development path, one of the key things that we know, it usually was happened after a deep crisis. Crisis moments are moments that you shouldn't waste, okay? And most countries have this. But in the end, just taking the constraints as given and working the margins is not going to get us very far. In the end, change will have to happen when you get somehow more common purpose across divides around sensible things of growth and development, okay? It's an interesting example here that if we think of, um, am I doing very badly in time? Probably, I'm um, not too bad, okay. Um, 
if I think of Sri Lanka, I was there last year, and it's very striking, you know? They all, all the political parties know that they need to do an IMF program. Quietly, they won't say this in public, they all know. They know that if the opposition parties, when they win the elections, they will have to work with the IMF. But at the moment, and they bluntly admit to it and say, we'll be on the street trying to kick out this government, and how do we do that by, by demonstrating against the IMF program? So it basically, the incentive to work together politically is usually not there. The incentive is to try to kick the other ones out, even if you know that certain things are sensible. Mauritius is a fascinating example, also a democracy. They went into an IMF program. I think they're negotiating it. We're talking going back a long time ago now. I think they started negotiating in 1979, almost immediately when the oil shock, the second oil shock started happening. They got into a program in 1981. They left it by about 1985. By 1987, they were growing at 12% per year. How did the politics handle this? We had, during the IMF program, three, or depending on how you count it, four different governments. All those who were not in the government always agitated against the IMF program. Every time they came into power, they quietly just continued and didn't change it. They know the political game, but somehow or another, deep down, amongst these advisors and a certain trust in some excellent economic advisors inside government, they managed to somehow keep it on track because they knew they had to do it. And arguably, that's their proudest moment in their democracy, that they actually found a way, despite the game they had to play in the political stage, they knew very well that somehow or another it was worth doing that investment. The 12% growth that happened from 87 onwards, and of course it's now close to a high income country, is a lot to do with having that period sensibly handled. And that's about common purpose and so on. Of course, there's no quick fix. So what I don't believe in, as long as we have one strong finance minister or one strong central bank governor, all will be good. It's irrelevant. The idea that people will say, oh, as long as we have a strong man who can actually tell us and de determine what to do it. No. In the end, these things bite if there's a certain consensus. There's books written about Bangladesh in terms of that element of that consensus. Naomi Hossein from SOAS, fascinating book on how somehow that developmental consensus is there. Indonesia, you definitely saw it emerging as well. It was there in Ethiopia as well, with all its weaknesses as well. So, how do you then finally give good subversive advice? Like in a place like this. I'll give you a couple of examples where I've seen it. And by the way, we sometimes do it, or won't we, we won't give it that name. Let me say for three areas, okay? So one of the big mistakes we make, often as international organizations, is saying, you know, this is your moment to do the hard reforms without any political nows involved. I can't really think of many politicians that have successfully managed to do serious economic reforms for the long term without being kicked out of office. Okay? You just have to understand that your best reformers <laughs> don't try to push them to do the hard things so that they get sacked. <laughs> That's not very, they're not being very helpful. Okay? So I'm a strong believer in second best reform really thinking through what can I do and how can I begin to maneuver it, do it slowly. Yes, maybe it will mean IMF program number 24 and 25 as well, but actually it may be worth it to doing it carefully but smartly. Fuel subsidy reform is a great example. How many governments got themselves in trouble trying to do it? All over it gets the people on the street because think of it, it's a great case here, you know? If I depend on fertilizer, as certain groups here do, uh, especially if you have loads of land, uh, that's petroleum linked. And then similarly industrialist with cheap electricity, of course, that's also linked with fuel prices. You know, they will want to block it. But they, the great thing about fuel reform is that they don't need to do that much to get it blocked. You just mobilize the mob. You normalize the people. Sorry, I don't want to reduce the, the people to the mob, but you can do the mob if you want to, and you can also actually mobilize the people. 
you can do it because it hurts for poor people. It hurts for ordinary people. It hurts for middle class people. So actually, it's very easy to raise up objections and, 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 and blocks against it. Okay. An unlikely country to have done this really successfully to do the reform is Iran, okay? Yes, admittedly, it had a gun next to its head in, uh, in, in 2013, uh, sanctions biting and the whole thing. But it was the country with most spent on fuel subsidies as a percentage of the government budget in 2013. They had to reform. It was the only way to do some fiscal consolidation. They were very smart. They know that you, if you simply announce, and we're going to protect the poorest with some transfers, the industrialists, you have very similar groups there than you would have here, they will still try to mobilize people and say it won't happen because it will affect their bottom line. So they still have incentives to block it. So announcing it, they'll say, oh, I don't believe it, and it will be badly done, and this group will be excluded or whatever. So what did the central bank and the government do? Actually, interestingly, with support from the IMF, they did a fuel reform in the following form. They arranged with the central bank, as the regulator of the banking system, that about 70 to 80% of the people would get on their bank accounts a little amount of money, a cash transfer, that was marked if this will be paid out to you when parliament votes in favor of the fuel subsidy reform. 80% of the people seeing a big check, and it was a big check. Two thirds of the fuel subsidy for one year was put in a direct cash transfer, cash transfer. That's a big sum of money. They used all the behavioral signs, all the things that you could get. Once 80% of the people saw that as on their bank accounts, there was no one on the street. It sailed through parliament. And they unlocked it and, and undid it. So put it differently, they worked around it. It was still a budget that only had saved one third of the fuel subsidy, but they managed to get it through. It's occasionally come back, but never at the levels as before. You need to do second best thing. This is not the IMF's normal advice. Oh yes, why didn't you hand out two thirds of the subsidy immediately as something else that's not helping you fiscally? Similarly, often in service delivery, I know lots of people here work on service delivery, and it's so tempting to actually find bits and pieces of interventions of slight structural reforms in the system and say, Punjab has been actually one of the states where this was very popular. Let's actually push through these kind of reforms and, and do it. Uh, for example, uh, you bring, uh, what's his name again, Barber in, and uh, you get McKinsey in, and you get a data system, and you get beautiful systems of doing it. Yeah. Actually, on the back of Pakistan, I had virtually every country in the world thinking DFID uh, should support us to set up a similar delivery unit system. Actually, I'm always being quite against them. Not that they're wrong, but somehow or another, one day, you'll need to get a system to work again for you. You'll need to get the teachers to be motivated, the head teachers to be motivated. And installing a top-down system in education Education is not a command and control type of sector. You know, in most countries of the world, including most people in the room, were people that were taught because they were taught by teachers that actually wanted to teach children well. There was no structure, there were no targets when I was in school. So somehow or another, you think I'm going to solve this thing, but I begin to potentially undermine. At least ask the question, and I'm not sowing problems for the next phase of education if that's the way I begin to deliver. That would be second best. And then finally, and this is really my final thing, if you go for, uh, if you go for um, uh, something, focusing on exports, of course it's a really useful thing if your economy is really distorted in particular ways, go for exports, and we hear it here. But can I emphasize, how important that has been for incentives in the politics, say in Indonesia and in Bangladesh, that they went for exports. And the way it works is as follows. Once you get used to an exchange rate that is competitive, then actually exports can earn. An overvalued exchange rate will kill you off. So you suddenly create a lobby group who will actually go for macroeconomic stability. And in Bangladesh, it was one of the really striking things is that it was often the garment sector, export-oriented as they are, 
that were all the time pushing for macroeconomic stability because they were really scared that the overvaluation would come back. And that's something you can do also again. I would say, so you don't simply do it because some vague idea you learn from doing from the world, but actually within your politics, it establishes this very carefully. And by the way, it means it can cost you something because the political economy gains in the longer term may well be uh, substantially higher. So what do I conclude? conclude? It's tough, you know. Politics and economics inter inter interact. And in the shortcut is, is really hard. So you have to, if you give advice, think very carefully through how can I see this implemented? How can I see this through? Because if the objective function or indeed other implementation constraints are there, and if you don't take that into, a sta into account, nothing will happen. Therefore, you know, better understand these political equilibria and it's never about a little technical twist. It never is. It never is. Technical twist, it's not it. And so basically, think through this political economy, understand, and maybe at least take into account these constraints, and maybe be a bit subversive, begin to think about, if they did it, who would gain from it, who would lose from it, who would be the spoilers, who would not, and can I use this as over time maybe shifting the incentives a bit more to something that's more sensible to growth and development? So anyway, that's, that's uh, it. Thank you very much. Fascinating talk, Stefan. Um, sort of certainly pushed us to think in various directions. Uh, so I'm going to um, use the prerogative of the chair <laughs> um, to ask one question and then we'll open it up. And I think we'll keep going till about 10.45. Um, that'll leave us some time for tea. Um, so my kind of big question is, isn't like one critique would be this is all tautology, right? I mean, countries that grow got consensual elite bargains, and that explains their growth, and countries that didn't grow couldn't make them. So how do you get past tautology to give it more meaning? Um, so, so, so there is, um, so, so there is an, an element, I wouldn't call it kind of tautology, but, um, sorry, seem to be, you can hear me, it isn't right here, okay. The, um, so, I mean, in some sense, these kind of frameworks are, and definitely the way I like to use it, uh, they are descriptive frameworks. You know, you describe and you begin to, to, to look at it. Um, one of the things to, um, I mean, it's a bit like how do you give it more meaning? So it's probably in two different ways. Oh yeah. Is that maybe in the first thing is that how do I know that somehow um, we, be, we, we see the emergence, for example, of an elite bargain that is more consistent with growth and development? Yeah. Now, for the economists in the room, it's a bit like how we often have thought about how do you understand preference? We understand objective functions to revealed objective functions, revealed preference. And so you start looking at actions and behavior, and you actually ask yourself, is, would this be consistent with, uh, with, with, with one model or with another model? I give a good example here. It's an easy one as well. One of the things about Lee Kuan Yew in Singapore, who is praised as this amazing leader, and you know, that it's quite an interesting set of things in the country. Once he came to power through electoral means, of course, first of all, it was a party that always had stop, stood for much more state-run development. Mm -hmm. So he started changing. So the actions and behavior were not quite consistent with the original objective. But what's probably one of the very striking actions and behaviors that you say, hmm, this looks like a bit different. One of his early acts, apparently, was to jail the main industrialist who had financed his election. And he jailed him for corruption. I said, it's going to be different. Now, 
if you want to do business as usual, you don't do that, okay? Uh, <laughs> so, so, and it's that kind of thing. So you start looking for actions and behaviors that are not quite consistent with, uh, with the usual thing. You know, it would be be willing to do something that potentially even can hurt and find a way of communicating to your base or whoever puts you in power, power, power to do this. And then the second thing is, how do you make it more meaningful? Is that we do have bits of evidence that, for example, sensible actions from below, civil society actions, mm. can at times yeah. work through by actually shifting overall objective functions, for example, the way politics is run. I don't know it's for Pakistan, but I know for Kenya and, and uh, Ghana, that actually, interestingly, uh, quite a lot of the actions that were done by civil societies, and there's been also some RCTs to document that, you can actually see that objective functions become much more outcome-based. Outcome so politicians are made to be more outcome-oriented, i.e. more consistent with development, than the usual patronage game. And so you see that in the data, and the electoral data, that these changes are came. So, so this is how I would begin to, to give meaning to it. On the policy side, they start doing things you wouldn't have expected them to do. Uh, secondly, um, the on, on the research side, to actually see, you know, can we tweak it, can we move it, and then, and then we can see some change. Thanks. Uh, the questions, Ijaz. Uh, thank you for that talk. It was it was very fun. I think I have two questions. I, th I hope they're related. The first is, um, what happens when you include international political economic interests yeah. in the in the elite bargain? So, yeah. multinational corporations, creditors, drug cartels, weapons traders, all of those people. And what happens if you conceptualize IFI as international financial institutions as outcomes of elite bargains on a global level? Related to that. What happens when you view advisors or researchers, us, as having our own political economic interests, which may in fact be inimical to those of the majority of the population? Because I know in Pakistan, if the wage rates went up, I wouldn't be able to afford my cleaners and drivers. So questions, thank you. <laughs> and can I kind of tack on to what he was saying? So, to, so one of the things that I, I felt kind of would be important here, given your mm -hmm. sort of foray into many countries, is what were the external constraints? Yeah. So I was a bit less convinced about the status quo perpetuating itself. In some sense, the cost of maintaining the status quo has been pretty low. Yeah. Um, yes. So that's, yeah. yeah. So, so OK. Um, look, these, <laughs> these are great questions. Um, so and, and in some sense, OK. So on the first one, you know, I, um, I sense your frustration and slight despair in your <laughs> comment <laughs> on the existence of, you know, it is a political equilibrium, and it's definitely the way I would look at it. The, and it may be linking to your point, is that it was remarkably stable, okay? It was remarkably stable because it worked. It worked partly because the external finance constraint was alleviated regularly enough um, would I say at least 23 times uh, with IMF programs, but also, of course, CPEC and all the other ones came out. So, so there. But this is the kind of thing that uh, I don't know, and, and, and you know, in your comments, uh, you get it as well, is that, you know, is it in a few years, is it in a decade? How, when, when, is, when, uh, when are we at this moment where, and then it becomes the interesting thing, that it becomes in the interest of some of the players within that dominant coalition today to actually forge a slightly different dominant coalition. And that's the way probably to think about it. This is about, you know, when you look at experiences of countries, there is a moment that actually, you know, if you think of the fall of Suharto in, in Indonesia, but if you think of countries I, I know better, um, the, some of the African uh, context as well, it is often like that at, at some point. You know, if you think of the fall of apartheid, is at some point white capital saw it in the interest of doing a deal with black trade unions. And that's essentially the end of apartheid. That wasn't there 10 years earlier, but at some point there is another coalition that can emerge. So it's the way to think about it. 
do I know how to do it? I wouldn't be just like an academic and an advisor. I probably would try to run places, you know, if I knew exactly what the magical trick to actually forge these coalitions. But, but there are, you know, some people, sometimes people say, oh, it's all about, s we need a strong man. You know, when I talk in Nigeria, and a little bit when I talk here, uh, but when I talk in Nigeria to people, then there's always an academic that ends up saying, maybe we should wait for the military to take over again. And then, you know, in itself, that doesn't solve the coalition formation. That doesn't solve, it's a temporary block on it. It doesn't solve it either, and so it's here. So I, I don't have a clear answer beyond that we know that there are very risky ways of unsettling this. You mentioned civil war. I think of Arab Spring. You know, it was all wonderful as a, as a you know, a, a, you know, 10 years younger self to so see, see all these things happening. And if you think not a single Middle Eastern country is in a better state now than it was before the Arab Spring for its ordinary people. So you kind of wonder, yes, there are not that many routes. What gives me hope, and I'll come back in a second then on the international part of it, what gives me hope is that quite a lot of countries have actually maneuvered with reasonable stability, including for their elites, for something that looked a bit different, that looked a bit more growth and development. That's not beautiful, inclusive institutions, inclusive society, but it's considerably better in many Asian, Southeast Asian countries now than it was before in terms of basic ordinary people. So, so it's that route is there. So it's not a kind of total change where all the deficits you have from political, democratic and rights and all the things, all of them are being lifted. But what gives me hope is that at least on the economic and development one, we had actually quite a lot of countries progressing. So anyway, uh, uh, the, the second question, of course, you know, one of the, I have a very, slightly annoying answer, okay? Mm. If I look back over the last 30 years, there were a lot of international political economy constraints from multinationals, from crisis, uh, from, from, from all kinds of issues to do. But it was an age where remarkable, remarkably large number of countries took advantage of opportunities. If you think of the scale of global poverty reduction, two-thirds of countries where we thought nothing was going to happen, uh, sorry, two-thirds of extreme poverty has gone down. So then the question becomes, yes, these constraints were there, but why is it that, um, sorry, these opportunities were there, why is it that some countries took the opportunity and others didn't? You know, it's, it's not as if Bangladesh didn't have all kinds of structural constraints. It didn't mean that, that uh, Ghana also had them not either. So I, I totally hear you, the international constraints matter, but I consciously wanted to say, within this kind of screwed up world of very e unequal opportunities for certain countries relative to others, some countries managed to do a lot of progress and others countries stayed, stayed stuck. Now, of course, then you get very specific circumstances and so on. And I think, you know, I mentioned already Afghanistan uh, implicitly. It's, it, on the one hand, helped the per perpetuation of the status quo here. That's basically there. That international circumstances is there. Um, that there. But, but again, I do not want to, I think it's too simplistic to actually say, uh, blame uh, for, for all the ills simply to the outside players. I, l I work a lot in, in African countries. You know, I usually would say, um, you know, it takes two to tango. So, you know, crooked investors, crooked, crooked players need somehow a group to actually work with and you get uh, internally and externally. And so, you know, you often have the foreign direct investment that you deserve, that your own political economy deserves. Sierra Leone has the most crooked foreign investors compared to Uganda, has actually done reasonably well to attract a slightly better class of foreign direct investors. And so you have to ask yourself again, who are the, what are the forces internally that allow this to be played? Okay, since we mentioned the IMF, I am, I'm going to be unfair now, I'm short for somehow. Uh, but I'm struck that there are clear differences between how countries deal with the IMF. Some very proactively think through what is the package of reforms that I can actually implement and see through and try to drive a very hard negotiation on the content of a package. And other countries are entirely focused on how much money will you give me. And if you do the deal on the latter one, 
Of course, you know, it feels like the Avais tell you what to do because then they take the Taj Tajikistan model and they give it to you. If you actually do very smartly other things. I was intrigued in Bangladesh to hear recently about a pre-crisis loan that the IMF has given. Yeah. A pre-crisis loan is an interesting one. Um, uh, someone who worked in the Ministry of Finance and, and said, it's really strange the politicians have managed to do the things they wanted to do already, and that's the IMF program. I say, okay, that's the point. They knew the crisis was going to come in about two years. They preempted it with a relatively small program. It helped them a little bit politically maneuvering the, the, the arrangement, and they actually sailed through the threats of the crisis by actually being proactive in the way they do it. So again, you know, all these political equilibriums are also negotiated, and you are and you are part of it. So um, I'm not sure whether that helped you. I didn't write properly. What was your point, then? So it was about the external constraints, but I think you. Uh, uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so yeah. So by the way. Unfortunately for Pakistan, the external constraints are far worse now than they were in the last three decades. So that's actually something I feel very quite pessimistic about, that it's actually much harder. Um, maybe good for Pakistan is that beyond the Gulf, nobody is at the moment playing the give a lot of finance game. And, uh, and, and my line usually about the Gulf is, if you have to go to the Gulf for your money, then you're scraping the barrel. So you're, you're reaching the, the low point because they will ask for your silverware uh, in return. <laughs> exactly, exactly, indeed, <laughs> indeed. <laughs> Thank you so much. We, we have about 15 minutes. We can catch tea uh, and oh, build on the conversation over there. Um, thank you so much, Stefan. It's wonderful to have you. Thank you.